Good morning. We are so glad that you're here at Eastside Baptist Church with us this morning as we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, we are uh, uh, glad that everyone's here. We want to extend a welcome to each one of you. But if you are a guest, if you are not a member or a regular uh, attender, then you're a special guest. We want to extend a special welcome to you this morning. I hope you got a bulletin when you came in. If you did, you're going to see there's a welcome tab on the edge of the bulletin. Please tear that off, fill it out, and drop it in the uh, offering plate when it's passed because we do want to get a record of your attendance and get to know you a little bit better. Also, at the end of the service, I'll be out by the welcome table. We have a special gift for our first-time guests. If you're a first-time guest, come by and introduce yourself. Or if you brought a first-time guest, bring them by and introduce them to me. And we'll make sure that they get that gift to say thank you for being here. Let's uh, go to the Lord and ask his blessing on our time together. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy and kindness. Lord, you have given us another glorious day that we can gather and worship you and attribute the honor to you that you are deserving. We ask that you would dwell with your people in a special and intensive manner this morning. We ask that you would move upon each heart, that you would move us to uh, sincere repentance from sin. For if there's anyone that's here that does not know Christ, we ask that you would draw that one to salvation. We know that you're glorified in no greater way than when one person comes to know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we ask that you would be lifted up. You said if we will lift you up, then you will draw all men unto yourself. And so we ask, Lord, that you alone would receive glory and honor, that you would hide us behind the cross, and that, Lord, that you would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. I ask you to stand with us this morning as we sing hymn number 437, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. We'll sing the first and last verse. back and sing that last verse again. Let's think about those words. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain for me. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again for me. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper that love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious sweetest that ever was heard. If you've heard that story and you have accepted it, this should be cause for great rejoicing as you sing through this verse. And say, tell me that story again. Remind me again of him dying on the cross for my sin 
and that his love paid my ransom. Think about you and your relationship with Jesus this morning as we sing this. If you have experienced it, sing it with joy from the heart this morning. Let's sing this last verse again. this morning in the name of the Lord. our season in which we collect for Operation Christmas Child. Most of you know what Operation Christmas Child is. Some of you know is the Christmas shoe boxes where we'll be uh, collecting for uh, the, uh, the shoe boxes that we uh, send through uh, Samaritan's Purse around the world to reach uh, children and their families with the gospel. In case you are not familiar with it, we've got just a brief uh, video presentation, about five minutes, and we'll go ahead and show that and give you an idea of what Operation Christmas Child does. And then uh, Glenda is going to say a few words. Imagine if an entire community could be transformed by a simple gift. When you pack a shoebox with Operation Christmas Child, you're packing more than just a gift. You're sending love to children in need all across the world. With each gift given in Jesus' name and fueled by the power of prayer, a teddy bear becomes a friend, a letter, an inspiration, school supplies, an opportunity. And as children hear the good news of Jesus Christ, God's love touches their hearts, churches are formed, 
and entire communities hear the gospel. And it all begins with your simple gift. The kids are playing, are laughing, joyful. It's like a whole world to them. Because for the first time they have received this precious gift. Using a shoebox gift so that we can tell them about the greatest gift of all, and that is God's Son, Jesus Christ. Just this year, 11 million shoebox gifts are being distributed to children in over 100 countries worldwide. Some of these kids have never received gifts before in their life and they are able to receive gifts here today. The message through the box is not only the toys that makes them smile. The message here is that Jesus loves them. <laughs> It's a go again to the world. You want to sing a young Millions of kids right now are getting shoe boxes all around the world, and we couldn't have done it without the strength and the support of all the volunteers. People from all around the globe are excited to pack shoebox gifts. This is a great tradition. Every year we get to do this with our family and to be able to give back to children around the world that we don't even know. We've never even met them before. It's just an awesome way to show the love of Jesus. Toothbrush, school supplies, toys. We just show it. <laughs> it's a joy to work with them. They're helping OCC to take the gospel literally to millions of children. They receive a box and also an invitation to come back and learn more about Christ. Give me a high five, high five, high five. Woo! Go. We follow up and we ask them if they want to be a part of the greatest journey. The first four lessons give them a chance to know God as their personal savior, as their friend, as their redeemer. După ce am primit, am primit acest cadou, am participat la lecțiile cea mai minat călătorie, după care am început să predau eu aceste lecții altor copii cea mai minat călătorie. Pentru că ele pot schimba viața unor copii, cum a schimbat-o și pe a mea. After completing the greatest journey, students take part in a graduation ceremony where they receive a certificate and a Bible in their own language. It's more than a box. It's church planting. It's community transformation. We are making disciples to go out and disciple others. So it started with a box, and it's ending with communities and countries being changed. The Great Commission, we're to go into all the world to preach the gospel, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what we're doing with the Operation Christmas Child. We're doing every bit of that. It never ceases to amaze me how a simple box can change the world for a child. It's real. It's not a story, it's real. It's actually happening. It was a drop of love. To them it became a huge ocean. Thousands will be impacted by just one gift. People have asked me, Franklin, did you ever imagine that it would be this big? I can tell you right now, no. It's something God has done, and I give God the glory. Every shoebox is important. Every shoebox touches a child's life. You see, I want the children of the world to know that God loves them, that He hasn't forgotten them, He hasn't turned His back on them. So many live in poverty, so many live in war areas, and all they have seen is just despair. I want them to know there's hope, and that hope is found in God's Son, Jesus Christ. And that's what Operation Christmas Child is all about, is about making Christ known to the children of the world. Thank you. We need your help. God bless.
like Pastor Tim said this morning, is the kickoff for the shoe boxes, and um, <clears throat> we've been collecting items all during the year each month to help fill the boxes. And, and this morning, I have some boxes out front, and we would like anybody that would like to just pick up one and, and do your own shoe box. All the instructions are inside of the box, and you need to leave seven dollars in the box for the postage because this year we did not have no postage budgeted in the budget so uh, we've got classes that's been collecting money for the postage and that's been really wonderful so we'll be able to do more boxes than we anticipated um, the boxes if you pick up one it's due back the first of november and um just so if you feel late, feel late to, to pick up a box and fill it just let us know and you can fill your box and all the instructions are inside and also we have a box out front that's uh, you can put money in there if you'd like to to help do the shoe boxes and um, thank you very much instructions there are certain things you can't put in the boxes and that's in the instructions as well so make sure that you pack them correctly uh, Jim you come lead us in our prayer time If anyone would like to come to the altar to pray, uh, y'all welcome to come. This morning, uh, we need to remember uh, Susan Thorsland and his family. Her brother passed away. And we also need to keep remembering Ann Mulligan and her family from her brother passing away. Our Heavenly Father, we're so blessed to be here this morning. Father, we could, could be in so many other places. Lord, doing so many different things. Father, but we chose to be here. Thank you for sending us and letting us come to church this morning. God, we got a, a good church and a, a blessed church. Father, we got good pastors and good leaders in our church, Father. We ask you this morning, Father, to help our church to work with uh, this uh, shoebox ministry, Father. We, they're sent all over the world, Father, and they uh, need so much, so much stuff for these kids overseas, Father, that uh, it may not get anything for Chris, Lord, we just pray that each side will take a big interest in this, and Lord, just can send as many boxes as we can, Father. Father, we ask you to be with our pastor this morning as he brings the word. Lord, we pray, God, that uh, if someone is in our midst this morning, Lord, that they will come to know you there as their personal Savior. Father, we realize there's a lot of people who are going through sickness and trials and tribulations and different things in their lives. Father, we pray, God, that you'll uh, just intervene with them, Father, and help them, Father. Just thinking of Deanna, Father, and the problems she's having, Lord. We pray that the doctors will find out what's wrong with her, God, and, and heal her and get her back into our midst, Father. Again, Father, thank you for everything you do in each one of our lives, how you protect us and watch over us, and just how you bless us. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 491, When We All Get to Heaven. May we stand as we sing.
thank you for the, the many blessings that we've already had this morning through song, Father. Father, we just ask that you be with us today in the service, Father. Just hide Pastor Tim behind the cross. Give him the words that we need to hear, Father. Father, as we come to this time in the service, we just ask that you bless the gift and the giver. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, choir. I hope we are all led by Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 1 this morning is our passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. We are beginning a new series on spiritual gifts. And one of the reasons I want to talk about spiritual gifts is because they are so misunderstood in our day. Now, in this particular part of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is dealing with some abuses that are occurring in the church at Corinth. Now, in the previous chapter, chapter 11, he dealt with the fact that there were some abuses that were occurring with the Lord's Supper. And so he straightened out what, what was going wrong with the Lord's Supper in Corinth. And now in this passage, he's dealing with some of the abuses, some of the misconceptions, wrong ideas that they have about spiritual gifts. And so this morning, we're going to launch into a short series uh, on spiritual gifts, and we're going to talk about what they are, why God has given them, and uh, what, what we are expected to do with our spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 1 this morning. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy, inspired, and inerrant word. We thank you for the truths that you have given to us today. We ask, Lord, that we would, help, uh, we would be helped, that we would understand better about spiritual gifts by hearing your word proclaimed this morning. Give us enlightenment, give us direction, give us guidance. Lord, help us to live according to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I was reading recently about a talented organist back in the olden days before they had electric organs, before they even had motors that would blow uh, air through the, 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 uh, the, the old organs. Back in that day, in order to operate an organ, you had to have somebody behind the scenes which would uh, operate a set of bellows, uh, blowers, that would keep air pumping through the organ while the organist played. Well, one day, this, uh, this organist, who was particularly well-known, he was doing a concert, and he did this concert, and it was tremendous. The sound was overwhelming, and it was just perfect in every way, and he received a standing ovation. And afterwards, as he was leaving, there was this little boy who operated the bellows in the back. He walked up to him, and he said, Well, we did pretty good today, didn't we? The organist looked down at him and said, We, we, I have studied for years to become the kind of organist I am, to become the musician I am. I've studied at some of the finest schools in the world. All you did was pump a few bellows. It is not we, it is I. I did great. About a month later, same organist doing a concert, comes to the very crescendo of his piece, the, the piece that, that is the, the loudest and strongest and needs the most air. And just as he's doing that, all of a sudden the air starts fading out of his, his keyboard. And so he, he looks over at the, the curtain where the little boy is and he says, I need more air. I need more air. The little boy sticks his head out from behind the curtain and says, is it we or I? Well, the fact is, folks, spiritual gifts are, are a lot like that. Every one of us has our part to play. Some of us are up front in front of the congregation. Some of us are, are, are very obvious to, to the world what our giftedness is. And some of us operate behind the scenes. But our gifts are no less important. In order for the church of Jesus Christ to function the way that God intends for it to function and to reach a lost and dying world, we need everyone's gift. Everyone needs to be present. I think I've used the illustration before, but it stands true. 
There, there was a story about a, 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 a man, a nobleman, many years ago who built a cathedral in a small town. And there was a beautiful, beautiful church. When everyone came the first day, first Sunday that it was open, every family was given a lamp. And there were hooks on the walls. And each lamp was to go on a specific hook. And the nobleman who built the church told the, the people of the village, he said, every family has a lamp. And there is no light in the church without your lamp. And when you are absent, when you don't bring your lamp, there's a dark place in the church. Folks, there are people in our community, in our community of faith in this church who have gifts that God has given them and He means for them to be used in the building up of the kingdom, the expansion of the kingdom of God in this community, but they don't use their gifts and so there's a dark place in the church. There's a dark place in the community. We need to use our gifts. And the thing I want to focus on this morning specifically is the fact that every member of the church of Jesus Christ is a gifted member. Every one of you has a gift to minister. And as an aside, let me just say this. Gifts are just that. They are not rewards. They are gifts. God does not give you a spiritual gift because of holiness on your part. He does not give you a spiritual gift because uh, there's, there's something that he looks down at you and says, well, you know, that Tim Harris, there's something special about him. I'm going to give him a certain gift. No. They are gifts. Matt, you read through the, the book of, of uh, 1 Corinthians, you look at this church in Corinth, and the one thing you do not get the feeling when you, when you read about Corinth, you do not get the feeling that this was an especially righteous church. When you read Corinth, about Corinth, what you see is that there was a lot of unrighteousness in their church. There was everything from sexual immorality to uh, the, the abuse of spiritual gifts, the, the abuse of brothers and sisters in Christ. There was all kinds of things that were just wrong in that church. And yet, the Bible says that church abounded in spiritual gifts. Because gifts are just that. They are God's gift to the church. Verse 7 says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Each one. Well, if our gifts are not based on personal holiness or anything special about me, then what are they based on? Well, they're based on, essentially, the sovereignty of Almighty God. The Bible says that He gives, the Holy Spirit gives us gifts as He wills. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills it. As the Holy Spirit wills it, He gives gifts to every believer. Every believer. Every believer has a gift. And that means that every believer, believer should be involved in the ministry of the church in some way, shape, or fashion. God does not intend for you to be a bench warmer. God has something for you to do. Now, it may surprise you, but when you got saved, when you came to Christ, God had a plan for how you would fit into His kingdom. Isn't that wonderful? That when God saved you, He knew exactly how He was going to use you in the kingdom. When Terry got saved, God said, I know exactly how I'm going to use Terry Borgschulte for the kingdom. When Ann Mulliken got saved, he said, I know exactly how Ann is going to fit into the picture here. And he gifted each one of us specifically to fit into that place and that ministry and that way of serving the kingdom of God. Folks, there are people out there that you will be able to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ that I will never be able to reach because your gifts are uniquely designed to reach certain people that I can't, that I would never be able to reach. Every one of us is gifted, and every one of us should be involved in the ministry of the church. Everyone has a contribution. Everyone has a role to play. Verse 7 says, The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one without exception. It doesn't say the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everybody except, well, there's that one guy. 
the, the, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everybody except, well, except poor old Paul over here. I, I just couldn't figure out what to do with him. You know, when you got saved, God did not look down and say, oh my goodness, Tim Harris got saved. What am I going to do with him? God wasn't surprised. He knows exactly what he's going to do with you. And he has gifted you specifically to fit into the kingdom for one purpose. It doesn't matter where you come from, what your background is, doesn't matter how much money or education you have, what your, your uh, uh, background you came out of. When a pagan becomes a Christian in, in the, the darkest jungles of Brazil or, or uh, darkest jungles of Africa or India somewhere, God gifts that individual for a specific purpose within the kingdom of God. At the moment, you're saved. Folks, your spiritual gifts are not something that you have to wait for God to bestow. Spiritual gifts are not something you have to pray through and, and uh, convince God to bestow upon you. The moment you receive Christ as your Savior, the Bible says the Holy Spirit indwells you. He moves into your heart. Romans chapter 9 says if you don't have the Spirit, you're not His. And when the Holy Spirit comes, He brings with Him everything you need. You never need more of the Spirit than the day you get saved. Now, the Spirit may want more of you than you're given to Him, but you never need more of the Spirit. He brings everything with Him. Everyone has an important role. We, we should never think of our giftedness, what God has given us as our spiritual gift, as, as something that is unimportant within the body of Christ. Everyone has an important role. We should never have an inferiority complex about our gift. Because without your gift, there's a dark place in the church. Without your gift, something's going lacking. I read a story about a man named John Collins back in 2012... Uh, he had resolved that he was going to break the Guinness Book of World Records for the, the farthest paper airplane flight. You know, who could throw the, the paper, a paper airplane the farthest? Now, the record had stood since 2003. And so he, he decided that there were two, two things that had to happen. First of all, you had to have the perfect paper airplane. You had to design a better paper airplane. Now, Collins was an engineer, so that was right down his alley. And he did design an excellent paper airplane. He designed probably the best paper airplane ever built. The only problem was he couldn't throw it all. He, he admitted, he, he said, and, and I'm not trying to insult anybody, he said, I throw like a girl. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to get this thing anywhere. So he went out and he found a former college football quarterback. And he said, will you help me? And the guy agreed. So between his know-how, building the airplane, and this former college quarterback's ability to actually throw something, they broke the Guinness Book of World Records. He threw a paper airplane 75 yards, three quarters of a football field, and are in Guinness Book of World Records today. But it took both abilities. Both abilities. Let me ask you something. Which one was unimportant? <laughs> well, the throwing of the, that airplane was the one that was up front, the one that everybody marveled at, but it had not been for the engineering, that plane would have never gone anywhere. Not everybody is exercising the gift that God has given them, and in part it's because they don't feel like their gift is important. Your gift is important. Your gift is important. Your gift is a birthday gift from God. At the moment you were born again on your spiritual birthday, God has given you your spiritual gift. And your gift is important. Your gift is not the same as everybody else, but it's important. Now, there are some out there who teach that certain gifts like tongues, everybody should have that gift. And that gift is more important than any other gift. Folks, that is not what the Bible says. There's nowhere in the Bible that indicates that your gift should be the same as the next person's gift. And there's nothing in the Bible that indicates that any of your gifts are any less important than anybody else's. My gifts may be more up front than someone else's, 
but it doesn't mean that person who is behind the scenes is any less important to the church of Jesus Christ. The Bible lists a lot of different gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, all have lists of gifts. Some of the ones that are mentioned include wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, the ability to distinguish spirits, tongues, teaching, helping, administration, exhorting, giving, showing mercy, and many others. Now, it is my conviction that the Bible does not give us a, an exhaustive list, but rather these are just representational of the many different kinds of gifts that God gives the church. And the point is that every member of Eastside Baptist Church has at least one, and most of us have more than one, gifts to be used. Now, verse 7 says that these gifts are a manifestation of the Spirit. They show that Christ is living within you, that He is working within you. And according to verse 11, it is the Spirit who inspires these gifts, who gives them to individuals. So the gifts are the sign that you are a Spirit-filled, Spirit-led person. Spiritual gifts come as miraculous gifts from God. So a spiritual gift is more than just a talent. It's more than a skill that you've acquired over the years. It is a supernatural empowerment by God to accomplish something for the kingdom of God. i, I give you an example. One of the, the best examples I can think of is many years ago, I got to see Billy Graham uh, in person. Um, I, and I saw him down in Columbia. And I remember when he stood up to preach, he was strong, he was vibrant. And many people responded, and you could listen to him and think, man, he's such a great preacher. Yeah, he's just such a great preacher. Years later, he spoke in Louisville. And this time, he was much older, much frailer. He had to be helped to the pulpit. His voice was not as strong. It was obvious that his physical strength was failing him. It was one of the last crusades he ever did. And yet, thousands of people responded. Thousands of people responded. Why? Because his spiritual giftedness did not depend on his physical strength. It was a work of God working through him. That is what a spiritual gift is. If you have a spiritual gift, you may be exercising a talent, you may be exercising some skill that you have learned, but folks, it is a spiritual gift if the Holy Spirit works through that thing and builds up the church and expands the kingdom of God through it. That's what a spiritual gift is. Some gifts are more flashy, some are more spectacular than others, some are more visible, some are more noticeable, but it doesn't follow that any one gift is more important than the other. There was a lady in, in a, one of the churches I pastored years ago, and her ministry in the church consisted of standing in the vestibule on Sunday morning and greeting people as they came in. She would give them a bulletin, and that was her ministry. And quite honestly, she didn't really do any other ministries in the church. She didn't teach. She didn't uh, uh, you know, lead a, a class. She didn't do a, a lot of other ministries. That was her ministry. But you know something? Years later, when she passed away, people came to me, person after person came to me, and, and their, their comment was the same every time. You know, the reason I'm at this church is because the first time I walked through the door, she made me feel welcome. She made me feel welcome. Because she had the spiritual gift of hospitality. And she did more to fill that church than I ever did. Folks, God can use whatever your giftedness is, and every one of us have spiritual gifts. It is the Holy Spirit that distributes those gifts, and He wills that no one, no one sit on their gifts. We need to use them. We need to use them. By the same token, though, since it is a gift of the Holy Spirit, it is His manifestation, and as I said, it is a gift, it's not something that we have earned, we have no reason to boast about our gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 says, For who makes you differ from, one, from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? 
Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Folks, our gifts come by the sovereignty of the Spirit. There's no bragging on our part. He just decides to give us a certain gift. And so that means that we should never brag about our gifts, but also we should never idolize somebody just because they have a certain gift, because the Spirit is working through them in a certain way. That means that we should not be devoted to a human leader just because they have certain gifts. And I know people, I'm sure you know them as well, you, you can probably think of a person right now who will tell you, well, I dropped out of church because I really liked that preacher and he went somewhere else. Or I dropped out of church because I really liked that Sunday school teacher and they, they died or something. Folks, we never put the gift above the giver of the gift. It is God that we worship, God that we serve. And we recognize when someone has a gift, God is the one to be thanked for it. He is the one to be praised for it. Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians 3 about pointing out, uh, the, uh, or I guess pointing to a human individual that, that, that we're going to follow. Every one of us has gifts that are given by God and not not because we deserve it. Leaders are just fellow servants. Ministers are just fellow servants. Sunday school teachers are just fellow servants. Singers and musicians, they're just fellow servants. And so we don't brag about our gifts. We don't envy another person's gifts. We don't idolize another person's gifts. Not someone's wisdom, knowledge, their singing, their musical ability, their preaching ability. Rather, we're to be content with what God has gifted us with. And it's attempt to use it the best way we possibly can. You know, if one person has hospitality, you know, one lady has the gift of hospitality, she should use that gift of hospitality to make people feel welcome in the kingdom of God. And not whine and complain and moan because, you know, this other person has the gift of teaching. I sure wish I was a better teacher. Or if you're a teacher, think, man, I, I just wish I had the gift of hospitality and you can make people feel as welcome as this person does. We all have gifts. Now, I realize that it, it's hard not to envy other people's gifts. I envy other people's gifts. You know, I, I, one day when I get to heaven, I'm going to be able to sing as well as anybody. One day when I get to heaven, I'm going to be able to, to, to sing. Some of you went to the... Uh, Crusade this week over Rock Springs, went over there. What, was that singing something else? Oh, my goodness. If you didn't go, you missed out. You really did. There was some of the best music I've ever heard there. I mean, there, there, some, of the, some of those people singing up there, they just gave you chill bumps on your chill bumps. And uh, there's, I just got so energized by that. I tell you, I, I enjoyed it. I wish I could sing like that. Not my gift. Not my gift. So I just use the gift that God gave me, best way I can. We don't envy other people's gifts. Notice also that your gifts are given for the common good. Your gift, and I say it is your gift because God has bestowed it on you, but technically it's not yours. It belongs to the congregation. It is given for the common good. Look at verse 7 again. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So your gift is given to you to profit everybody else. Which, by the way, is one of the worst reasons for somebody to say, well, I don't go to church. I've heard people say, I don't go to church because I can worship God at home just as well as I can at church. Even if that were true, and it's not, even if it were true, you're robbing the other people at church of the gifts that God has given you that you're supposed to be ministering to them. You're robbing your fellow believers. One of the best reasons to be a part of a church is because God has given you gifts that you are responsible to minister to other people. You're robbing your brothers and sisters in Christ when you don't use your spiritual gifts for the common good. I heard a story about a man. He had a, uh, a dream one time. He was touring hell. And as he's touring hell... There's a, a banquet set on this huge table and, and all kinds of wonderful food, best food you could ever imagine. And, and the, only, the only problem was that all the forks and spoons were so long that you couldn't get the food to your mouth. 
And so the man asks the, uh, the angel who's giving them the tour of hell, he says, what's heaven like? And the angel says, well, it's pretty much the same thing, only there they feed each other. Amen. Folks, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Amen. We're supposed to be feeding each other. Our gifts are to be ministered to our brothers and sisters in Christ. They do not belong to us. They're not for you. And if you use it selfishly, you're misusing it. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We talk about stewardship in January. One of the aspects of stewardship is being a steward of the gifts God has entrusted to you. Because they're not yours. You're just holding them for everybody else. Don't misuse your gift. Don't abandon your gift or neglect your gift. And definitely, don't use it selfishly. Some people think my gift is for my benefit. It's not. It's for the congregation. It's for the church. We can be very selfish in the ministry of our gifts. We can be very selfish in the use of our gifts. I, I read about a, a uh, radio station number of years ago, did a survey, and it asked people this question. It said, if you could have any superpower, superhero power, what would that superhero power be, and what would you do with it? And the people who took the survey said that two things were interesting. Number one, most people knew instantly what they wanted their superpower to be, as if they'd already thought about it, you know. They knew exactly what they would like their superpower to be, but the second thing that was interesting was they almost always said they would use it selfishly. They, they asked, they said, well, what would your superpower be? One man said, I'd want to fly. They said, why? He said, so I'd never have to take the bus again. They asked one woman, what do you want your superpower to be? She said, I would want the power of invisibility. He said, why? And she said, so I could sneak into movies free and I could shoplift all I wanted to. <laughs> well, I asked one man, why, why don't you use your, super, would, why wouldn't you use your superhero power for good? Why wouldn't you use it to fight crime? to help people. And he said, well, you know, if I tried to use my ability to fly to rescue somebody from a, from a burning building, I might catch on fire myself, so I'm not doing that. Very selfish, very self-centered. Some people are that way about their gifts, their spiritual gifts. You know, I'm only going to exercise my gift if it benefits me. Your gift is not yours. It's to be used for other people. And it should be used. It is a gift. Folks, what would you think, how would you feel if someone gave you a gift or if you gave someone else a gift and you wrapped it beautifully with a bow on it and everything and you went to visit them uh, a year later and you walked in and there's that gift still wrapped in the box sitting on a shelf. How would you feel? Well, didn't you like the gift? Oh yeah, it's nice, it's all wrapped up, I just left it up there. The gift was meant to be opened. <laughs> it was meant to be used. But God has given many of us gifts that we just never use. Paul, more than once, uses the analogy of the human body. And he says, we're all many parts, eyes, ears, hands, feet. And he uses this to illustrate how the church is to work together like the parts of the body work together. We all have various gifts, and we all have our purpose. And folks, if one part of the body doesn't work, the body is lame. If one part of the church is not working, the church is lame. God intends for us to work together. And only when we work together are we going to accomplish what God has for us to do. You know, in Argentina, every, every person in Argentina has to spend two years in the military. Probably a good idea in the United States, too. It's been two years in the military, and it's almost impossible to get out of military service for any reason. There's one man who uh, was drafted for his military service, and he showed up, and he said, I, I need a waiver on this. And they said, why? And he said, well, I don't have any arms. And they said, nope, you're good. <laughs> Put him in the Army. He goes to basic training. He, he gets the basic training. He said, I don't know what I can do. I don't have any arms. And his drill sergeant said, uh, see that man up on the hill? He's uh, uh, drawing water into a bucket. 
He said, he's blind. He can't see when it's full. Go up there and tell him when it's full. <laughs> see, we can always work with somebody else. We can always work with somebody else. God intends for us to work together and for all of our gifts to mesh together. And when one person's gift is not being used, it's noticeable. It's noticeable. There was a well-known conductor who was holding rehearsal one night, and a huge uh, orchestra of people were playing. They were uh, blaring horns. There, were, there was an organ. There was clashing of cymbals, violins. All this was going on. And the very back, there was one guy who played a piccolo. He thought, nobody's going to notice if I play this piccolo. Little bitty piccolo. So they're going through and they're playing the piece. And it comes time for him to come in and he doesn't come in. And the conductor stops and says, stop. Something's missing. Something's missing. And the same is true about a church. You ever go to a church, you ever walk into a church... And they seem to be doing everything right. You know, they seem to have their, their, their things together. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But you just think, you know, something's just missing. So something's missing here. Can't quite put my finger on it, but there's something missing. Somebody's not using their gift. Somebody ought to be playing a piccolo somewhere. Somebody is not doing what God has called them to do. And for far too many churches today, people are content to sit back and let other people do the work. Came across this poem. It says, there's a clever young man named somebody else. There's nothing this fellow can't do. He's busy from morning till late at night just substituting for you. When asked to do this or asked to do that, so often you're set to reply, get somebody else, Mr. Chairman. He'll do it much better than I. There's so much to do in our church, so much, and the workers are few. And somebody else gets weary and worn just substituting for you. So next time you're asked to do something worthwhile, come up with this honest reply. If somebody else can give time and support, it's obviously true, so can I. God has called every one of us to use our spiritual gifts to advance the kingdom of God and build up the church. So let me ask you something. Are you using your spiritual gifts in ministry? Are you using your spiritual gifts in ministry? There's so much that you can do. We've got Awana coming up. You can work in Awana. You say, well, Pastor, I, I really am not good with, uh, with kids. I'm not a good teacher. I can't. You know what you can do with that? In Awana, you can sit and listen to a Bible verse. How many of y'all can listen to a Bible verse? <laughs> we all can. We all can. God can use you. God can use you. Doug was telling me today, he needs one more person to work in children's church on Sunday morning. One more person to do it one time a month. Can you do that? Can you do that? Is that what God's calling you to do? What is it that God has called you to do? How, what kind of gifts do you have? Well, some of you are saying, well, pastor, I don't even know what my gifts are. Okay, you know how you find your spiritual gifts? We can give you a little spiritual gift inventory. Talk to Brother Doug, he'll give you that. That'll help you. But you know what the best way to find your spiritual gift is? Try something. <laughs> Try something. Try it. for. This, I'll give you a 90-day challenge, okay? 90-day challenge. Do something for 90 days, and if after 90 days it's not your cup of tea, say, you know, that's not my gift. We'll let you go as long as you go do something else for 90 days. Keep it up. Eventually, you'll find out what your gift is. You will. 90-day challenge. Folks, use your gift. Use your gift. Are you that person who's involved? And all of us tend to fall in one or two categories. Either you're that person who's got 14 different jobs and you're being worked to death, are you that person who just sits on the pew and doesn't use your gifts? Which one are you? Which one are you? Are you like that, that person who is doing more than you really should? Are you that person who, like the woman who wanted to be invisible so she could shoplift? Are, are you just not concerned about anybody but yourself? Because God has given you a gift, and he's called you to use it for the kingdom. Now, if you're here this morning, you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. Before you can make a valuable contribution to the kingdom of God, 
You need to know Christ as your personal Savior. You need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit before you can be spiritually gifted. If you're here this morning, you don't know Christ as your Savior. The Bible says, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, separation from God for eternity in a place called hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord, the, uh, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved today. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior. In just a moment, I'm going to stand here at the front during our last hymn. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, come to the front and say, Pastor, I need to know Christ. I need to know 100% that if I died today, I would go to heaven. Or if you're here this morning and you know Christ as your personal Savior, maybe you need to start using your spiritual gifts in a way that will advance the kingdom of God. Commit this morning to becoming a contributing part of the church of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, your compassion, your mercy, and your grace. And we thank you, Lord, for your giftedness to the church. We ask, Lord, that we would use the gifts you've entrusted to us, that, Lord, we would be involved, we would look for ways that we could be involved, and that, Heavenly Father, that our church would, would grow that we would reach this lost community with the gospel because of the, the giftedness of this church. And Lord, that you would do marvelous things we can't even imagine because people are willing to do what you've called them to do. Lord, we ask that you move in power this morning. If there's any that doesn't know Christ, draw that one to salvation this morning. And for the rest of us, convict us of where we've come short, that we might be better servants of Christ in Jesus' name.